One thing that uh, the Harris campaign would love is if President Biden would bring home a ceasefire in the Middle East uh, right now between Gaza yeah. and Israel. And yeah. we know that uh, Secretary of State Blinken is over there right now working with Netanyahu. The reporting is that former President Trump is uh, on the phone with form the, the Prime Minister of Israel, urging him not to cut a deal right now because that is, it's believed that would help the Harris campaign. So um, I don't know uh, where, where that, I don't know, who knows wh whether that will come about or not. But I have to think that um, the Harris campaign would like for President Biden to, to do what presidents do, which yeah. is work on that one. Yeah. Surprise, surprise, Trump is reportedly pressuring Netanyahu behind the scenes to reject a ceasefire deal because it would, of course, help Harris. And politically, it makes sense for him to root against the ceasefire deal, although morally, it makes him one of the most despicable human beings on the planet. A Gaza woman and her six children were murdered by the IDF this week. An entire family gone like that. Last week, a man lost his wife and their newborn twins. A minimum of 40,000 people have been murdered, but all Trump can think about is how their suffering might be able to benefit him politically. It is downright despicable, and there aren't enough words to describe how disgusting he is as a person. And not to mention, if this is actually true, he's breaking the law by sabotaging the United States because under the Logan Act, private diplomacy is unlawful. Quote, any citizen of the United States, wherever he may be, who without authority of the United States directly or indirectly commences or carries on any correspondence or intercourse with any foreign government or any officer or agent thereof with intent to influence the measures or conduct of any foreign government or of any officer or agent thereof in relation to any disputes or controversies with the United States or this is key to defeat the measures of the united states shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than three years or both so this isn't just similar to when trump told republicans to reject biden's right-wing border deal because you know sabotaging domestic policy that's one thing but it's an entirely different thing if he's actually undermining the united states on the global stage that could carry the penalty of prison but, you know, I think that he knows he can do this with impunity because that's the way that Trump operates. And to be fair to Trump, it's not the first time that this has happened, because as The New York Times reports, Nixon also tried to undermine Johnson's Vietnam peace talk. So, you know, it's not necessarily anything new when it comes to American politics, because politicians are more than willing to spill the blood of innocence for purposes of political expediency. But Trump is just one of the more brazen ones when it comes to using war to his advantage, even though he tries to portray himself as somebody who's anti-war. But, you know, that's a fucking joke. But when it comes to Netanyahu, it is time for Democrats after the story to finally wake up and see him as the partisan actor that he is. Netanyahu has been very clear. He wants Trump to win. That's obvious for anyone with eyes, right? He's a Republican for all intents and purposes. And the fact that Biden hasn't adapted to that political reality demonstrates why he's so unequipped to deal with Netanyahu. And it's why he's been humiliated publicly and undermined so many times by Netanyahu over the last 10 months. But everyone can see Netanyahu is in the tank for Trump. He wants Trump to win. Three weeks ago, they had a private meeting at Mar-a-Lago, and we don't know what was said between the two of them, but Trump did publicly say that Harris was, quote, disrespectful to Netanyahu since she didn't go to his joint address to Congress. But since that meeting, Trump has been beating his chest on this issue, and he's even threatened to deport so-called Hamas supporters in the United States, i.e. anyone who criticizes Israel for anything ever. And he's even attacked Biden for being too weak on Israel's critics in the United States. And and he's also attacked Biden for pushing a ceasefire in the first place. So Trump is trying to outflank Biden from the right on this issue, but that's pretty difficult to do because Biden is already materially supporting Israel in every conceivable way, even though Trump is simultaneously accusing him of not being pro-Israel enough. Like, how could he possibly be more pro-Israel? He's doing everything that they want them to do. But for Trump, it's not enough, apparently, which is absurd. But, you know, Trump can try to convince voters that it is the case 
that Biden is too weak on Israel because Netanyahu has been helping him make that case. He's publicly blasted Biden for supposedly withholding weapons from Israel, which is a lie. But that lie was spread by Netanyahu to help Trump. The only bombs that the Biden administration withheld were 2,000 pound bombs because those are too destructive for civilian population centers. But guess what? Biden is still giving them really big bombs and never stopped. He gave them 500 pound bombs and the DOD just approved another $20 billion for Israel last week. So Biden has allowed Israel to violate international law and commit war crimes with impunity and shielded them at every step of the way and has been a complicit participant in this genocide. But yet Trump is like, mm, he's not doing enough to help Israel. And Trump is now trying to somehow be more hawkish than Biden on this issue. But the only way that he can plausibly be to the right of Biden on this issue is with rhetoric by claiming that he'll be even more supportive of Israel and crack down on free speech here in the United States against critics of Israel. So it's disingenuous for Trump to say that he's more supportive of Israel, but I mean, Netanyahu is still rooting for Donald Trump regardless because he knows Trump won't even have to pretend to care about Gazans like Biden does. So being a little bit more unrestrained is why I think Netanyahu wants Trump back in the White House. Not to mention, Trump moved the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem and he gave Israel the Golan Heights and Trump's Abraham Accords bypassed Palestine to normalize relations between Israel and other Arab countries, which is in part what led to October 7th in the first place, but regardless of how unproductive Trump's policies were, Netanyahu liked those policies, and he's been very happy with Trump, and I'm assuming he wants to repay the favor by helping Trump get elected again to see how much more he can get out of a Trump administration. And one of Trump's donors, a pro-Israel donor, Miriam Adelson, is saying, you know, she'll give him millions of dollars on the condition that he allows Israel to annex the West Bank. So when Trump says he's going to be to the right of Biden and more supportive of Israel, a lot of it is talk, but there are things that he can do to conceivably be worse than Biden on this issue, if you can imagine it, right? Now, the fact that Biden can't see that Netanyahu is in cahoots with Trump is so frustrating to me. And I say this because to even say that the Biden administration at this point is pursuing a ceasefire deal is just wrong. Even though we keep getting headlines about how Israel accepted the ceasefire deal and now it's on Hamas to do the same, that's all bullshit. And I want to show you what I mean by that. Axios reports, quote, Hamas on Sunday rejected an updated U.S. proposal for a ceasefire and hostage deal in Gaza, blaming Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu for moving the goalposts and the U.S. for indulging him. The White House has claimed significant progress had been made during talks in Doha over the past several days. The rejection of the new proposal, which was presented to the parties on Friday, makes President Biden's goal of getting a deal this week almost impossible. Now, I want to pause right there to discuss the headline because the headline puts the onus on Hamas, right? It emphasizes that Hamas rejected the ceasefire deal, which suggests that Israel is the one pursuing peace, even though they just executed Hamas's political leader when he was in Iran. Now, if you execute the person that you're engaging in diplomacy with or supposed to be engaging in diplomacy with, what exactly does that say? It says you're not a serious partner for peace. You're not actually trying to strike up a deal if you execute the person you're trying to negotiate with. Right. They're not serious about peace. Netanyahu wants to prolong this war as long as possible, because when it's over, so, too, will be his political career. And he may even face corruption charges. So he has nothing to gain and everything to lose by actually agreeing to a ceasefire and ending the war. But he still agreed to a ceasefire, according to this article. Right. According to the Biden administration. Right. So if he agreed to a ceasefire, why wouldn't Hamas accept it? That's insane. Well, let's look at the details of this so-called ceasefire. Axios continues, Hamas objects to the fact that the proposal doesn't include a permanent ceasefire or comprehensive Israeli withdrawal from the Gaza Strip. It would also not allow the free movement of civilians from southern Gaza to the north because it endorses Netanyahu's demand for control of the Netzarim Corridor. The proposal would also give Israel control of the Rafah crossing and the Philadelphia Corridor along the Egypt-Gaza border as Netanyahu has demanded per the Hamas statement. Hamas said Netanyahu also reversed previous concessions and set new conditions in the prisoner exchange process. All this prevents the completion of the exchange deal, Hamas said. So this is a ceasefire name only. 
the terms of the ceasefire Biden touted before, where a temporary ceasefire would lead to a more lasting ceasefire potentially, are no longer on the table. Right? The terms have changed. There's no permanent ceasefire here, no withdrawal of IDF forces, not to mention Gazans would no longer have free movement between northern and southern Gaza, and this greenlights a more stringent occupation by Israel in Gaza. Now, I understand that Biden is anxious to get this done, and he wants to rush to solidify something because he's worried about escalations between Israel and Iran and Hezbollah, and those escalations could potentially draw the United States in further. But why would Hamas agree to a deal that doesn't actually lead to a permanent ceasefire? It doesn't make any sense. See, this is why so many activists are calling on Biden to do an arms embargo, because so long as you keep supplying them with the weapons to continue this genocide, they have no reason to stop. They're not going to do what you want them to do if you won't use your leverage, Biden. And if he would have been able to get a ceasefire without an arms embargo, that would have been a different story. But the fact that these talks have been going on for so long and nothing has changed means that Biden's strategy has failed. But he still won't change course, which is all the more reason why Kamala Harris should make it very clear that she'd be different than Biden on this issue, because if she doesn't, the stench of Biden's failure here will get on her. And that's something that she doesn't want. Now, the uh, senator from Michigan, Gary Peters, who was in contention to be her running mate, made it very clear that Kamala Harris should definitely start to draw distinctions between herself and and Biden on this issue because of how much he's fucking this up. Not his words, mine, but nonetheless, what he says is a very important point. You think it's important for her to show that distinction on her views toward Gaza with President Biden? Yeah, if she has those views, she has to be clear about whatever those views are. She'll have to make... Doesn't she? Yeah, if she make, if she, and I think she has differences, yeah, yeah. and she'll talk about it. Have you, Back to authenticity. Be who you are. Yeah. Be what's in right. your, your God. Tell us what, what motivates you, what drives you. People want to want to see that. Will you convey to her at some point uh, in the next couple of weeks that she ought to do that? Yes. Oh, yeah. if I have a chance to, yeah. I'm sure you will. And he's right. But as I've said in other videos, she doesn't necessarily have to be explicit about her disagreements with Biden. She can be more implicit and signal her openness to a policy change without explicitly saying it. Although I don't think it would hurt her. To be more direct, she'd win over more uncommitted voters and she wouldn't lose any moderates in the process who also support a ceasefire. Like most of the country supports a ceasefire. So I think this is the right step. And Harris distancing herself from Biden's failed policy here is becoming increasingly necessary, especially in light of news that Trump, like Netanyahu, is also trying to sabotage peace talks. Under these conditions, I'm sorry, you've got to throw out the old playbook and adapt to the new political reality. Netanyahu is a partisan actor who's in the tank for Donald Trump. Not cutting off weapons to Israel and allowing them to continue the genocide literally helps Trump. That is what Biden is doing at this point. He is helping Trump by not doing an arms embargo. And his weakness here is a major political liability for Harris since she's tied to him as vice president. And if Biden isn't going to do what needs to be done to stop the carnage, Harris should say that she'll do what Biden won't do in order to win over the uncommitted voters. And more importantly, in order to stop the bloodshed. Because let's remember, we're talking about human lives here at the end of the day. So what's mere politics to us here in the United States is a deadly nightmare to Gazans that just won't fucking end. It's been 10 months and the time for this to stop is long overdue.